worship the Lord in song and lift him. We just invite you to enjoy the presence of God, sing along, worship with us. And our whole purpose this morning is just to lift up the name of Jesus. Join with us. Would you stand and sing it? Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for oh, the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. Oh, and all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. got a communion cup get it and I said oh, we don't have communion cups up here um, those of us up here might need some so um, we're gonna take communion and I was listening to um, this speaker this week while I was working and he was covering kind of a tough topic and um, I was just kind of listening to it and there was something that he said that really struck me he was kind of talking about sin and he was talking about a few specific ones but one of the things he said in this discussion was he said the worst thing that can happen to us as people as Christians but as people is that God just gives us over to our own will and desire um, the Bible does talk about that that God will just say fine go ahead and I was thinking about that because I was just thinking 
That's so true. The worst thing that can happen for us is that God finally just just says, okay, I'm just going to give you over. You, you just, you keep fighting. This is what you, you're wanting. You know, God, we're not robots. God doesn't, you know, force us to love him. He doesn't force his will on us. That is something that we have to choose. We have to choose to love God. And we have to choose to want his will in our lives. And I was thinking about how sometimes we do just fight God, right? We, we, we want our own thing, our own way. We know what's best for us. And that usually just leads us down a road of destruction, of despair, of shame, of guilt, of really just this really tough, hard, sad road. And I thought the last thing I want is for God to say, okay, go ahead. You know what I mean? I want God's hand in my life, and I want to follow his direction, and I want to follow his will. I don't want to go down this road where I just get what I want, because what I want is typically not what's best, right? Right? What I want really is usually not what's best. And I need God in my life. I need Christ. I need his will. I need him to lead me. I think all the times about, oh, I just don't know what to do sometimes. And I don't want to make the decision. I do not want to have to make the decision. I want God to help guide me where I need to be. But that requires me to give up control. And that is so hard to do. I wish sometimes that God would just be like, pop, you know, like smack me on the head and be like, hey, enough. You know what I mean? Like I was laughing this week because our son plays flag football. Our oldest does. Our, well, two of our kids do, but our oldest, you know, it's a little more competitive when you're 10 versus 6. Um, well, it depends on what team and parents you're playing. <laughs> Some parents of the little kids seem to think, this is like NFL, but um, I'm like, oh, six. But the 10 year old had a game and they were playing this real mouthy team because they're going pro. <laughs> and um, the parents were fine, but the kids were real mouthy. And this one kid just kept mouthing. He's like, we're going to beat him anyway. I was like, yeah. And our son's job on offense and flag football is he's the center and he snaps the ball. And if you don't know flag football, the, there's no protection from a blitz. So, like, if the quarterback is getting rushed, he's just got to try to, like, uh, you know, he, he, there's, no, there's no protection because it's flag football. But the center can put his hands behind his back, and he can kind of step like this just to try to – he can't, like, bump him, and he can't, like – but he can kind of step and just try to give a little bit of protection to the quarterback. So this real mouthy kid was like, mouthing. We're going to beat him anyways. And very next play, he's going to rush the quarterback. So, (laughs) Graydon snaps the ball. Our quarterback's trying to, you know, find an open guy. And that kid starts rushing. And Graydon has his hands behind his back. And he just goes like this. And the kid ran smack into him. And the kid fell to the ground because he ran into a 100-pound wall. And, um... And I said... after, And so, of course... The kid gets up off the ground, and he's like, you can't do that, to the ref. And the ref was like, and the ref was just kind of like, to Graydon, he's like, don't move next time. Like, it was like, no big deal. So I was laughing. So after the game, I said to Graydon, I was like, listen, I'm not really upset about what happened because that kid quit mouthing after he ran into you. But I was th- thinking about that picture of this mouthy kid. Just, I got me, 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 and we're going to whatever. And then he just ran into that wall that was great. And, and it was like, ugh, knocked him back. And then he got quiet the rest of the game. They still won. Listen, they're a really good team. But he got quiet. And I just thought, man, <laughs> sometimes that's us, right? We're real mouthy. I know what's best for me. I know what I'm going to do. Sorry, God, but, like, I've got this. My business partner used to tell the story of her daughter when she was little. They were praying, and her daughter had a rural attitude. And she was like, God, and help my daughter. Just please help her. Let's have a good attitude today, and let's have a good day. And her daughter, in the middle of the prayer, goes, uh, sorry, God, not today. 
And she was like, oh, Lord, help us. But I just thought, that is us. We are that mouthy kid. We are the ones that are like, nope, nope. God, I know better than you, God. I've got this. Like, I know what I'm doing. And we get real mouthy. And sometimes I wish we would just run into God the wall and be like, whoa. He'd just be like, hey. But it's usually not like that. Usually we make a lot of decisions and do a lot of things that just lead us into a tough situation. And then we wake up one day and we're like, man, what am I doing? Am I living my life for me or for God? And, and we just need to be reminded that our life outside of God has no hope. But our life with God has hope through Jesus Christ. At communion, we celebrate or remind ourselves what God did because he loved us. He loved us so much, he sent his son into the world to take on our sin, our punishment, our shame, take it to the cross. And then he conquered death and was resurrected. And therein is where our hope lies. And how could we not want to live in the will of that God? Serve that God, trust that God. So we're gonna take communion this morning. And when you take it, I just hope that if you have just been doing your own thing, that you will think, do I really want to be surrendered to my own will? Or do I want to just be in the will of God? Do I want to just trust Him? And just know that that is where our hope is, in Christ. And we can trust Him. And so we're going to take this morning. So I invite you to take up a wafer that represents the body of Christ broken for you. And to take of the cup that represents the blood that was shed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you loved us enough to send Christ into the world. God, I just pray that we will trust you with our lives, God. That we will live in your will, God that our life outside of you has no hope, has no meaning, and has no purpose. That our life with you has forgiveness and grace, mercy, hope, joy, peace. And that is what I pray, God, that we will stop trying to do things our own way and we will just surrender our will to who you are, God, and that we will trust you. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Someone will pass around to get your cups and join us in this song. Unfailing love, unfailing love, and you never change God. You remain the Holy One in my unfailing love, unfailing The one I hold on to, you are my song, and I sing for you, and everything you hold in your hand, still you make time for me. Praise you, God, the earth and sky. How beautiful is your unfailing love, unfailing love. And you never change, God. You remain the Holy One and my unfailing love, unfailing. you God of earth and sky how beautiful is your unfailing love unfailing love and you never change God you remain the holy one my unfailing love unfailing
My name is Vanessa. I was born and raised in Honduras. Growing up, we were always worried about money, how we were going to be able to pay the mortgage of our house. I also remember gathering around the table, eating dinner, not knowing what we were going to eat the next day. I think that the hardest part was going to school every day, knowing that at any point of time, my siblings and I were going to be kicked out of the classroom because tuition was never paid on time. When I was six years old, I was invited to church. I never been to church before. I had no idea what Sunday school was, but I was really excited to, to go. And in that particular time of my life, I was being abused and going to church, meeting my Sunday school teacher, listening her talk about how Jesus cleaned 10 lepers, how he was the only one who didn't reject them, who loved them unconditionally, just like they were, that clicked something in my life. And I knew that I wanted to be part of, of this person called Jesus. It was a struggle for me to go to church because my dad didn't want me to have anything to do with religion. And every night I'll go to bed and I'll ask God the same thing. Please let my mom and my dad come to church with me. Please let them know about this man named Jesus. And two years later, God answered that prayer through a very difficult situation. My dad was involved in a car accident. He broke his back in five parts. He was not gonna be able to walk again. When a group of brothers and sisters from church knocked at our door and asked him if, if they could pray for him. And that afternoon, God completely healed him was a testimony of God's faithfulness. So when my dad saw what had happened, he couldn't deny that God healed him, and that's how they came to the Lord. When he told us, okay, we're gonna go to church as a family, it was a joy, a miracle. One day, the pastor told us that they were having a surprise for the children, and I couldn't stop asking my parents, do you know what it is? I remember going to church and the first thing that comes to my mind when I remember that day is a big red shiny box. We had a special service. They told us that inside that big box there was a special present from Jesus to us. When they finally called my name, I ran as fast as I could, and I couldn't wait to open it. It was amazing. Everything inside the box was new and shiny and clean. Everything inside the box was, was mine. I remember having stickers and, and beautiful pencils. My favorite thing was this nice pair of fluffy pink socks. They felt wonderful on my feet. They were, they were pink, they were not white. And when I looked at all those things, I was just so excited and I kept asking my parents, who sent me this? Who knows that I loved all these things? Did you tell anyone that I wanted new pencils? Who did you tell that I wanted socks? And I remember they looking at me and they told me, Jesus, Jesus knew and he sent you this box. And I literally thought, Jesus sent me the box. It gave me hope. It made me feel special. It reminded me how he loved me. And that shoe box represented the love that I thought I didn't deserve when I was six years old. God loves the children of the world. People who pack a shoe box are being an instrument used by God to deliver the gospel. That is the greatest gift.
it might not look like a lot, but it means the world to us. Good morning, everybody. So as you can see by that video, we are kicking off our annual uh, shoebox collection for Operation Christmas Child. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a program that uh, Samaritan's Purse hosts that specifically goes out and shares gifts that churches around the United States and other churches around the world collect, largely, mostly in the United States, churches like us. We collect uh, items for shoe boxes for children and bring them to children that need to hear the gospel and need their hope uh, in Christ reinforced. So sometimes they already know God, like the story you saw, and they are just in poverty and they need help and they need items and they need hope. And other times they're hearing the gospel message for the first time and we are growing churches and growing faith around the world. Um, so wh whatever the circumstance is for these children, they take, we take them to orphanages, they go to churches that are already established in impoverished areas, they've taken them to war zones, they, they've sent boxes out to Ukraine. Uh, they go everywhere to spread the message of God's love, of, of God's hope and salvation, and the fact that people... Christian brothers and sisters in Christ care, care enough to spend the time to put something special together for each one of these kids that they would never receive otherwise. Um, a lot of the videos, when I was trying to find a good one to start us off with, um, several of the people that were speaking mentioned that it was clean. It smelled clean. It looked clean. Uh, the items were new. So uh, it's just amazing that it's just such a simple thing that you would take for granted because that's the kind of life they live. And we're able to help them out in the most amazing but simple way. Um, and, and we can reach so many children in a way that wouldn't be possible without doing it through a larger organization like this. Churches just don't have the bandwidth to get out there and to spread the gospel in the way that an organization, when you become part of a larger organization where, you, where you're contributing like that, can do it. Um, so if you know anything about Samaritan's Purse, they help in a lot of different ways. They do disaster relief. They're headed to Florida right now. I just saw an email it hit my inbox the other day. So uh, they, they're all over the United States and the, the, the world helping where they can with a lot of different ministries. But this is the ministry we focus on here to help children and to spread the gospel message. So we're going to be uh, handing out boxes. I'm going to have a table out, out uh, front for a little while, uh, handing out boxes for you guys to fill with items. I have some information on what is acceptable, what not, um, labels so you can put boy, girl, age group, all of that good stuff. Some of you are probably familiar with that. And uh, we're going to start collecting them and bringing them back to the church in around mid-November. This year, our church is participating a little bit more than prior years. Uh, we've become a drop-off because the former uh, Tomball drop-off uh, had some uh, issues with the people that were there, and they moved away. What's uh, uh, thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I am so excited, and sometimes I try to get through stuff. Uh, a drop-off is where all the churches in the area bring the shoe boxes they collect. So a lot of different churches in Cypress and Tomball and Spring, all around our little area, will be packing shoe boxes, well, all over the United States, but they need a place to go to bring their shoe boxes. And we are going to be one of those locations this year. So it isn't just churches either. I will just say community groups, student groups. It's a great time to um, meet people from your community and people that really need help also come. I mean, people are driven to it for all kinds of reasons. I, my first time volunteering at a drop-off location was out in Katy. Uh, you know, they're, they're spread pretty decently apart. So I was volunteering out in Katy uh, and 
the first people that I happened to deal with was a grandfather and his two um, young grandchildren. And they brought in boxes. They had one each. And, they, and I said, uh, one of the things that you're supposed to do as a, as a drop-off volunteer, which I will be asking for, by the way, is ask them if you can pray with them, if there's anything you can pray with them about, or can you pray over the boxes with them. And so I asked them that. And uh, they said, can you pray for our mother? She's really sick. And so I said, yes, let's pray. And we prayed over those boxes. And um, that grandfather was just so touched. You could tell he was really hurting over the situation. And so you're, you're not just picking up boxes, putting them in a carton, and shipping them off. You really are helping your community when you do that. So. We're going to be taking volunteers. I have a sign-up genius list that we're going to be circulating online uh, that you can volunteer a couple hours of your time in the third week of November. If you're not comfortable praying with people, there are other things you can do. You can put boxes and cartons. You can tape them up. All kinds of things you can do. And I'll get that circulated uh, here for you but in the meantime on the way out today and for the next few weeks pick up some boxes fill them with stuff I have suggested gift items and they need toiletries they need school supplies they need like a little toy or fuzzy socks or whatever you think would be important to a child you're allowed to put a note in there pictures um, you know uh, write I love you or anything you want inside of that box and means something to you and your family. It's a great activity to do together with your children. So I just really encourage you to pick up as many boxes as you want and to fill them up and bring them back to church uh, in mid-November. So you've got lots of time. You can pack what, what you think is important, and we can get this done um, and hopefully uh, beat our prior totals by a long shot. Thank you, guys. had a very patient young man that came in from the outside and he has informed me I'm cutting into his playtime but <clears throat> it's all right we're cool we have had a little competition on who can um, memorize the books of the Bible and thanks to the sun their Sunday school teacher Carolyn Hall she has really been working with them and also of course all of the parents and everyone and Chris I believe you've also been in there too helping to thank you so much and they've all been doing such a great job and we have our youngest that has uh, done his and he came up to me and I do believe he even said it the fastest that we've actually said so fast that I, I, can you do it one more time just so we, we can hear it because it was pretty fast but whatever he did it and congratulations Mr. Jaden <laughs> <laughs> you got to get back to that play time. Mm -hmm. And then the next young man last Sunday was a very patient young man. This mother must have raised him correct because um, I'll tell you what, last week I didn't know he was waiting on me. And I was just sitting and visiting with a friend. I think it was actually Jackie after church talking, talking, talking. And then the next thing I know, I turn around and there's someone just standing there just waiting on me. And I have no clue how long he was waiting. And in fact, is he in here? Or was it? Uh, oh, okay, there he is. Mr. Liam, come on. Congratulations. Good job. All right. And then I'm also up here just because I did want to say thank you so much to the ladies on the ladies retreat. Our ladies' retreat, um, I would just like to summarize it in just some words that I wrote down. So, ladies' retreat 2022 on how I feel like it will be remembered. Plenty of food, mailboxes, rock collection, fall season, fishing, interior designers, oldest women, biggest feet, arthritis, <laughs> water bottles, broken down knees, table of weapons, clean ladies, light purses, best bus drivers, what's in your museum, wedding talk, beautiful walks, chats by the fire, friendly competitions, 
being kind to one another, and hairbrushes. That was our retreat with my church family, Ladies of Grace. And huge thanks to Tara for putting that on. Um, it was a great time and our pastor's wife for the devotion. So ladies, look forward to next year. We go every year in the fall. Um, and so we, we always look forward to that. And that was a great summary. Um, I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements. And then we'll have song and sermon um, coming right up. But uh, coming up at Grace... There's a new series in the adult Sunday school class going on, and it has today's lesson, but in your bulletin, it tells you next week's lesson, which next Sunday, it will be about um, the truth about the rapture. Are you teaching that? Oh, that's Wednesday. I don't see next Sundays. There is a next Sunday. It's on the front. Just ignore me and look at a bulletin because it says it right there. Next Sunday, uh, the lesson is a humiliated king. Coming up on Wednesdays, which we have going on, um, people are sharing their God in my journey. And next, this coming Wednesday is Juanita Hughes. She'll be sharing her journey. So be here at 6.30 for pizza, 7 o'clock for class. And there are children's activities and youth as well. So be here for that. Then October 9th is our pastor with the truth about the rapture. But next Sunday school lesson is the humiliated king. So adults can be a part of that. We have Sunday school for all ages. Um, Here at church, you can give at the donation station. His wife's birthday is today. Nice job. Give extra in our tithes and offerings for her today. I know Kenzie, she doesn't get it. In her honor. You know how people want you to give on their behalf? Give on Mandy's behalf today. The offering's not really big. You don't love Mandy. Um, So um, (laughs) um, it was Mackenzie's birthday, too. Did anybody else have a birthday this week? Happy birthday if you did. It says in the bulletin, congratulations to Cash and Mason on their engagement. I'm going to be the mother of the bride, y'all, guys. I'm a really young mother of the bride, but I'm going to be a mother of the bride. Congratulations to them. It's not about me. It's about you guys. Congratulations. Um, But you can give. Back to the giving on Mandy's behalf. Um, You can give in our church foyer. Remember what Jackie said about picking up boxes today as well. You can give online as well or mail your checks in the old way. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. There there are a lot of people out um, today. We've got people sick with different things, so God knows all of those needs. Prayers for all of them in your bulletin on the back page. It lists prayer requests. If you would like one included, please be sure to let us know. Carolyn, we have you in there, but you're doing well. Um, prayers for Carolyn. Galen, we're praying for you continually. Tony and Kathy Hollick lifting you guys up. Tony's recuperating, and Kathy's taking care of him, and so prayers for them. Autumn Coleman, continued prayers. Gary Mouton, Madison Jackson, and uh, there are many more that aren't mentioned. Uh, Terry Hollick's mom, continued prayers. So we're going to go to the Lord now in prayer and just lift all of those needs up. He knows every need in this building, and so we'll lift them up to him now. Join with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence this morning. Thank you for all the things coming back, opportunities to give with the shoe boxes and different things. Thank you for our Sunday school children learning more and more about your word. Thank you for birthdays and ladies retreats and all the things that we get to do. And God, we're just grateful this morning to be able to gather together and worship you. We lift up every need for healing, strength, financial needs. You know all of them, God. We lift them up to you now and ask that you meet them according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing this last song um, this morning. And you can't see the screen that I see, but when we were practicing it, we're singing it, and and there are great words to this song. But for some reason on our screen back there, if, if you have less words on a screen, they're really big. And as I was practicing, you can turn around and look if you want, but... The biggest words on our screen, not yours, were these that we're going to sing, I trust in you. I um, thought this week at the ladies' retreat, we were talking about so many things and and so many wonderful things, but I 
I love the feeling that we get in a group of women, a room full of people like this morning where we are there because we trust in God, a God that is more powerful than we are, a God we can't always understand his plan, but we trust him. Have you ever done the trust fall exercise? You just fall back. I'm not a trusting person. Sorry, God, because I do trust you. But I'm not a trusting person, so I, I, I'm not good at that. Just trusting that someone will be there if I fall back. And when you're not a trusting person, sometimes, the only thing that you can trust in is that God is sovereign and consistent. He's all present. He never changes from the beginning of time till the end. He is the same. And so when we sing this song, um, we're going to sing this, I trust in you. And I hope that all the other beautiful words in the song, I hope that the main thing that stands out to you today is wherever I find myself at this moment, I trust in a God that is so much bigger than me. So worship with us in song. somebody going through something doesn't mean that you're sick yourself if you need something from God today would you stand while we sing this next verse and it doesn't have to be everybody but if you need healing in your body if you know somebody that does and you're comfortable with that I would love for you to stand and we will all join you in just a moment but I would love for you to stand and, and let us let God know you know he's capable of anything whatever you need this morning so stand if you want to while we sing this part. You hold my every moment. You calm my raging seas. You walk with me through fire. And you heal all my disease.
Thank you so much for being here. Jackie, thank you for that presentation. I wish I could use the word bandwidth casually in a sentence like you do. <laughs> My wife and I love getting the shoe boxes every year. Uh, when Jackie started doing this, we weren't sure what to put in them. And then after we kind of got the idea and watched a few more videos, <clears throat> it's just become one of those enjoyable things we do every year. We get a few shoe boxes, boy or girl, you, you designate and we enjoy stuffing them. I take the boys, because I have no idea what to buy for girls, and she takes the girls, and this year we're thinking about just not spending any money on our grandkids, just putting it all. <laughs> oh, they're not in here, any? they're upstairs. <laughs> just putting it all, just putting it all in the shoe boxes. So thank you for doing that. You can thank her for me after a while, Scott, for tackling that every year. It's such a joy. God bless you today. Thanks for being here. Thank you for watching by live streaming. <clears throat> thank you for visiting. If you're a guest today, a few of you here, thank you for visiting. Nice to see you. Nice to have you. And if I hadn't had a chance to meet you and hang around a little bit, I'd love to meet you. I want to talk to you about how's the view today. I'm going to read uh, during these next few slides. I'm going to read from various verses that don't really go together. I'm hoping that we make them go together today. <clears throat> but we're going to start with Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hang on to those verses for a minute. Uh, we're going to read different kinds of verses, but hang on to those for a little while, and we'll come back to them later. I, uh, I have traveled, uh, I don't know if extensively is the right word or not, but I have traveled a lot around the United States, um, mostly for work, not for pleasure. Uh, I've done seminars in, I know, 22 states at least, uh, and five cities in each of those states uh, at different times, different cities. So I don't know how many places I've been to along that line. Uh, but uh, it was always a, a, a surprise, you know, like I didn't go back to the same hotels, uh, same places. So every time I would get my itinerary uh, and fly out on Sunday, I would fly somewhere, go get my rent car at the airport, go to the hotel that was booked for me, and uh, it was always a surprise. A few places I went back to uh, so I knew what to expect, but most of the time it was always a first time, a surprise. And so uh, I got to see a lot of cities in America from New Jersey, New York, to uh, 
Seattle and Oregon and Southern California and uh, uh, just all over. One of the things I, I, I did for a while, looking back on those days, just doing seminars, uh, I'd fly around the country to teach about three subjects I was certified in. I know you chuckle because you think I'm certified in nothing but certifiably insane. But uh, I taught how to supervise uh, employees, how to manage, how to mentor uh, new managers, uh, how to develop a training for uh, training uh, employees. Uh, I taught finance and accounting for non-accountants, uh, how to set up books, how to qualify for loans, how to, how to balance your inventory and sales ratios and so on and so forth. And I, and I taught uh, uh, English and grammar for people for whom English was not their first language. That was interesting. I only taught a few of those. That was always fun because I was the only person who spoke proper English in the building sometimes. One uh, company in New Jersey sent about 200 secretaries to a seminar. And I did not know until that seminar that the English language is probably the most impossible language to learn. It is. You don't think so because you take it for granted, but when you start trying to explain why the, just the diphthong E A can be pronounced so many different ways and no rule of thumb why, why it's here or heart or dearth or whatever else you can put on it or bear, it's just E-A. It never sounds the same in so many different words. That was fun. One of the other fun things I had was checking into a new hotel and then opening the window to see where I was. And nobody takes the cake better than Wilmington, Delaware. I flew into Philadelphia, did a seminar in Philadelphia, and then did a seminar north of Philadelphia in King of Prussia. Who knew there was a king of Prussia? Are you serious? Y'all actually knew there was a town called King of Prussia? I had never heard of it until, well, you're from up there, aren't you, New Jersey boy? Yeah. I'd never heard of that. It's a beautiful place. You go north, I think it's north out of Philadelphia, King of Prussia. Did a seminar in King of Prussia. And then I had to leave there and go to Wilmington, Delaware which is like, you know, a whole nother state away, 45 minute drive or so, I think. And I got into a beautiful hotel. In fact, they, you couldn't drive up to the front of it. They had made what used to be a street into a, like an open mall, a walkway, a old cobblestone, it's just beautiful, scenic place and a unique hotel. I, it wasn't a chain, I can't remember the name of it. it and I was really impressed when I went in and this first class service and I took the elevator up to my room. I walked over to the window and pulled it back and I, what I saw is what you see up there. I was literally, an alley that was down below somewhere and right there was an old red brick warehouse and uh, there were a few windows in the wall that went to nowhere. You could see they were just dust covered and, that was it. it. It had been a warehouse district, and that warehouse behind was still standing, and the hotel built anyway. And you, if you were on the backside, you just looked out at a red brick wall 15 feet or so away. That was your view. So that takes the cake. There were some others in Colorado that were beautiful, and some California hotels that you look out. The, one of them in Tennessee had a waterfall out back of my window. I looked out the window to a waterfall and a little brook coming down. And, 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 and so I, I, I one time tried, uh, the, the, the company that I was doing seminar for, the largest seminar training company in the world, wonderful employer, great people, about 22 years ago when we kind of started over down here in the shopping center down the street. And uh, so I was just uh, working the seminar circuit and uh, they had a little form you could fill out and make a request and send back to Kansas City. So one time when I was filling out the request for things I would like to have on my future trips, I put in there rooms with a view. I would like to have a view. 
I don't care. It's just anything besides a red brick wall or a parking garage. I stayed in one in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, a, a nice hotel. I think it was a Hilton right in town. I opened my window, and right there was the ramp of the parking garage and cars uh, parking. And at night, when they pulled in, their headlights were just above the uh, concrete uh, barricade. So at night, I would just see a flash of headlights, boop, and hit right there for a moment on the deal. So I requested room with a view. I got a phone call. <laughs> just off of that, I actually got a phone call. And uh, the lady who called me was the booking person for, for the seminar speakers. And uh, she said, so something must have happened for you to request that because they like to take care of their speakers. And uh, so I told her about the red brick wall in the parking garage. And she said, that is good to know. And believe it or not, they took that hotel off their list. They would put their speakers in a hotel that didn't look out onto a red brick wall. It's a great hotel. Shouldn't have built it there. If you want a view. Our family takes a vacation, uh, try to every year, and the last few years, I think Hudson found the last house we, we stayed in. And it, you know, if Hudson finds it, it means he's gonna try to get his dad to pay for it, so we don't care. And uh, man, talk about a view. Wow, you look out the back three or four porches, whatever it had on it, and go sit out there, and it's just beautiful. I don't even remember the name of the lake we were on now. There's an inlet off the lake. Anybody remember? What, where were we? Huh? LBJ. Uh, I don't know where I am anymore. I just get in the car with my wife, and she, she or that Google woman will tell me where to turn, and sometimes they don't agree. And I listen to the Google woman, and uh, she knows everything, or Siri woman, whoever they are. And uh, man, we had a beautiful view this last summer, and how for many years, I don't know if they request it when they're looking for hotels. We've been to Galveston on family vacay, beautiful view, a uh, few times, different places. We've been to, uh, we've had great views in the mountains. We've just had, been really, really blessed to have, for the most part, great view. Sometimes we're just in a neighborhood and we see the house across the street. But, uh, but I have discovered over the years that it's important. It is important to have a good view. If you've ever been on a vacation and been disappointed when you get to the place you booked, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If any of you married men have had to actually go down to the front desk of a hotel after you check in for a little while, everybody's trying to go to bed, and you have to get up and go to the, I'm not talking personally here, I'm just suggesting that this might have happened to you, have to go down to the front desk and say, we need another room. We can't stay in the room, even though it's 1130 and I'm wishing to God I was in the bed asleep. Apparently we're not gonna be able to survive the night in that room because there's way too much light coming in and there are trucks outside the window. Could you put us in a better room? And thankfully, most of the time they will try to accommodate the view is important, isn't it? You like to see something that looks pleasant, that looks safe, that looks rewarding, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, of course, I'm trying to get around to teaching you a Bible study today, and I'm just going to make it kind of simple in that graphic. There's always evil in the world. You will never, ever go anywhere that evil is not present. But you will also never not be able to see good if you choose to see it. Sometimes the view that we have of life is not one we're forced to have. It's one that we can choose. You're choosing today how you see the world. You're choosing an opinion about everything you hear about on the left side of your screen. You have formed an opinion about Ukraine. Ukraine, you may not have any idea of the history of it, but you've already got a view of what's going on there, one way or the other. It might be right, it's probably wrong. I don't imagine any of us really know enough of the history and the underpinnings to know what's really going on there, but 
bless your heart, I bet you got an opinion, and I bet you have a view that affects your political mindset in some way. You know what went on with the, you, all of you have an opinion about the pandemic that we have now come through. I don't, I don't know if it has anything to do with the fact it's an election year, but I have heard politicians say, oh, the pandemic is over. Well, it's over unless you choose for it not to be over then, because it's all how you look at it. It's what you choose to see out your window, and you do have a choice. It doesn't matter how much wickedness is in the world. You have a choice when it comes to how you view everything. I have a choice about how I view my wife. I can view her as a troublemaker. I can view her as a counter to Google woman. I don't know. It's always a woman's voice that responds, isn't it? Do they ever put a man's voice on those things, your phones? I think it's always a woman's voice. I have to ask myself why. I think I know the answer. We would all rather hear a woman's voice than a man's voice. If any of you old people are old enough to remember the Hewitt, the HP Jornada before all these fancy phones, anybody remember the GPS things you could put in your car a long time ago? and they talk to you? Thank you, Reed. Me and Reed, remember, I had the HP Jornada. It was the latest and the greatest at the time. You got to pick the voices you wanted to speak to you in navigation. I picked another name you won't remember unless you're old, Mr. T. I picked Mr. T. It was the coolest thing ever. I don't know why they don't still do it. I would be driving down a boulevard in El Paso after getting in my rent car, and, and, and Mr. T would say, turn around, sucker, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> that is the truth. And so sucker would look for the next U-turn and turn around so that Mr. T could say, now, now you're going the right way. In two miles, you turn right, sucker. And that's the way he talked to me. It was the coolest thing. Now some woman with the calmest, smoothest voice that no woman ever had <laughs> there you go again. It's the way I choose to view life. I can view her as a counterpart to Google. I can view her as my feminine side of Mr. T, which I may do today. I may not have a choice when Mr. T throws me out of the house today. I, uh, I, I can choose uh, what I think about President Biden. I can choose how I view the former President Trump. I can, I can form my views about the Democrats and Republicans in the United States. I can form a view about the Premier of Canada. I, I can get, I get a little bit of this from uh, the left side of the screen. You know, I get it online, TV. It gives me all I need to know. I, you notice in those views up there, I didn't even put the Bible up there anywhere. Who, who ever turns to the Bible to get your view? And, and because what, what does the Bible know about politics? So you have a view today, and, and, and only you know what it is. When you look out the window into the world that you are a part of, you see what you have chosen to see. You, you got it? We're just trying to make a little foundation here because sometimes I struggle to get my point across. So I really want this one to come across today. Romans 12 chapter says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good. Somebody say good. Acceptable will of God. Don't conform to the world because the world won't help you prove the good and acceptable will of God. So don't conform to the world. Change your thinking. Renew your, you see the words there? Transform yourself. Not by hocus pocus, not by spiritual infusion, but by the renewing of your thinking. You see the verse? It's pretty clear, isn't it? 
J.B. Phillips' translation quotes that verse this way, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. The D.P. Carpenter, y'all have heard of him, the D.P. Carpenter version translates that verse, don't let the world view become your view. You, you with me so far? You, you got me going? Let, let's jump to the Old Testament and read a great story. Love this story. You'll love it too. If, if you hadn't seen it before and it's a first reading for you, you're going to love this story. Elisha the prophet, uh, like prophets often did, had made some people really mad at him. The kings didn't like prophets when the kings were breaking the will of God. When the kings were doing their own thing and rampaging without God telling them to do it, uh, kings didn't like prophets who came along and corrected them. Elisha had developed some enemies of the king in the king's house. So the uh, men of the king came to uh, the king because he had said, who is causing all this? And the men of the king came and said, it's that prophet. It's like a bird tells him, a little bird tells him. You wonder where that phrase ever came from. We whisper it up here. We, we make our war plans, and it's like a little bird carries it to Elisha. He knows what we're talking about. Only he didn't. He was just listening to God. And so they say to him, it's Elisha, the prophet in Israel. And the king said, then you go find out where that man is living, because I want him. And so they sent spies out, and finally they found where he was. And in verse 14, the king sent horses and chariots and soldiers. They came by night, and they encircled the city, the little town where he was living. They encircled it. And Elisha's servant, oh, it would be a prophet in those days when you had servants. I don't know any preachers that have servants. Elisha had one. His servant rose up early. Of course he did. You get up before the prophet and you make the coffee. You have the bacon and eggs ready. <laughs> what? We're talking about servants. Servant rose. You see that phrase right there? I should have underlined it. He looked out the window. Hang on. We're going to connect these dots after a while. The servant looked out the window, got up in the morning, to get ready for the prophet to get up, get the coffee going, went over, pulled the drapes back, and the shock of his life. He pulled back the drapes, and he saw that the city was surrounded both with horses and chariots and soldiers, and the servant comes running back to his boss, the prophet Elisha, and he says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? I, I, I wish somebody would make a movie of this because I can just almost picture Elisha completely nonplussed. No big deal. Because Elisha said, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You say that, don't you? I got the Lord. The Lord's bigger. My God is bigger than the devil. He ain't no booger man going to get me. Or is it boogie man? I don't know. Booger always seemed right to me. Hey, ain't no booger man going to get me. I got the Lord. The Lord's with me. I know. I know. We say that. But look at this prophet. Don't you be afraid now. Because those that are with us are greater than those who are with them. And then he prayed. Lord, I pray you. Open my servant's eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. That army outside the village was surrounded by a greater army all the way around them. Horses, chariots of fire? Are you kidding me? And they had been there the whole time. When the servant went to the window and looked out and saw what he saw, what he could not see was still there. They didn't suddenly come swooping out of the clouds because Elisha said so. They were there. He just couldn't see them until his eyes were open. And the prophet, we don't even know he got up and went to the window. 
He's still laying on bed waiting on the smell of coffee and bacon. And he simply says, well, maybe not bacon. I, I guess that would have been a Jewish thing maybe. But nonetheless, he was waiting on his coffee. And, and he just says, Lord, open his eyes. Because a prophet already knew not to fear. No matter how big an enemy comes against you, don't fear. Because those who are with you, there are so many verses, you know the verses. If the Lord be with us, who can be against us? If the Lord is with you, there can be a lot of people against you. But those who are with you, the Lord, always greater than those things that come against you. It's there outside your window. But you have to see it to believe it. And some of us won't believe it until we see it. Elisha didn't have to see it. He just knew it was out there. The prophet saw only the worldview until the, I mean the servant, saw only the worldview until the prophet said, Lord, at least this once, would you open his eyes? Would you just let him see? And then the servant saw the prophet's view. He got to see why this prophet could make the declarations he made and never fear for himself because he knew what was out there beyond the enemy. That was his view. He saw it. He chose to see it. You got that? Looked out the same window. You can't change your window. You can't change your circumstances, but you can change what you see through your window. Now, remember I started this with Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 23 through 25. We often go to verse 25 if you're just reading that because it talks about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And so, you know, you always think, oh, that's a preacher's hook trying to get people to come to church. Well, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. If you read 25 without reading 23 and 24, then you're missing the entire point about 25. Verse 25 is not a standalone verse like a clarion call. Everybody needs to be in church. You live streamers ought to be here in person. That's not what verse 25 is about. Verse 25 goes with 23 and 24. If you didn't notice it a moment ago, there are three commandments in 23, 24, and 25. And if we miss 23 and 24, 25 means nothing. So let me just walk you through again a little refresher on what those verses told us. What church does for you sometimes is just clean the windows. That's what it's supposed to do. You that are gathered here today, thank you so much for coming here. You're not here so you can give an offering unless you love Mandy today. If you don't love Mandy, put nothing in. But you're not here for that purpose. You didn't come today so you say, oh, I guess we better give something to the church. That's not why you're at church. And you're not here because we have a number board out there counting how many, you know, how many did you have today? 25. Oh, that's good. We only had 24 last week. Yay, we made progress. That's not why you're here. You didn't come for that reason. And here in this church, you certainly didn't come to get any uh, ribbon, you know, perfect attendance or anything, because we just don't pay attention. That's not what it's about to us. So that's not what you came for. And those of you that live stream, you, you're not live streaming because if you've been live streaming before, you didn't tune in today because you know you're going to hear something you never heard before. You're not. You're not going to hear anything wonderfully unique or powerfully important. That's just gonna, all you're going to hear is a word of God, and you're going to hear it the way the Scripture teaches us to use it. And that's the value of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and where we were a while ago. Because these are the three commandments. Starting in verse 23, we're supposed to practice our faith. Keep your faith. Honor your faith. And if you think that just means I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, then you hadn't read the rest of the New Testament. You got to read it because what keeping the faith means is do the things Christ taught you to do. That's keeping the faith. Keeping the faith is not a verbal belief statement. I believe in Jesus. The devils also believe. James wrote that. The devils believe also. And they tremble. Do you tremble? No, I, I believe in Jesus. I don't have to tremble. And, and James said, if you, if you believe, you have faith, show me your works by your faith. 
Faith without works is dead. That's what James said. Faith without works is dead. So when you come to verse 23 and it says, keep the faith, practice your faith, it's saying, do the things that a faithful person is supposed to do. Now just hang on with me a minute and we'll let you go eat. Your faith requires you to forgive others when they hurt your feelings or they offend you. Your faith requires you to keep hope alive and never despair. Your faith requires you to look out the window and realize no matter how many bad things are coming at you, there's something bigger on the other side of them coming after them. Your faith requires you to trust in God completely and exhaustively. Your faith has to say to you, God's bigger than anything that can get me. God's bigger than death because God is life hereafter. God's bigger than a pandemic. God's bigger than malaria. God's bigger than grenades. God's bigger than bullets. You Vietnam veterans, and uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We had to learn to just say, I, I live or die, not because I'm smarter or tougher than anybody else, but because I've just put my hand, my life in God's hands. I live or die because God will choose for me to live or die. And that is faith. Your faith was, if I make it out of here alive, if, what do you mean if? I mean, if I do, it's because God wanted me to. Faith is not just saying you believe in God. Faith is practicing the things God wanted you to practice. And then the second thing on the screen was uh, we provoke I use the word encourage here, but if you remember the verse 24 is to provoke each other. Man, I like that when it's followed up with to good works. You get provoked a lot, don't you? People provoke you on the highway going to work, don't they? Tomorrow morning, someone's going to provoke you. They're just going to cut you off at the wrong time. And if you drive up beside them and Make sure they know they may even provoke you worse. I chuckle. I'm telling you, the freeways in Houston anymore, there's insanity on the freeways every single day. I hit 99 every day, and every day I pass at least a dozen unbelievable, ready-for-lifetime TV fruitcakes. They are so angry. They're, they're in a race, and you're impeding their progress. And, and even if you practice all the rules, I drive on the right lane until I'm ready to pass somebody. I only use the left lane for passing. I don't just park in the left lane and ride like some of those people do on the freeway. But isn't it amazing? It's, it's funny because you get so irritated at how people are. And then somebody, you'll finally, you'll finally get past the last truck and you move over so Speedy back there, you know, you're only doing 83 to get around the truck, but Speedy back there is dying to do 95. And as soon as you get up past the last truck in the road to get over, Speedy comes blowing by at 95 and he's shaking his head. <laughs> there is so much provoking in the city every day. Everybody's provoked to anger. I didn't want to slap you people. And here comes a verse that says, hey, provoke each other unto good works and hope, love, life, good things, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember that? And the point that this writer of Hebrews is trying to tell all of us is if you don't get it yet, I want you to get it before you leave in the next few minutes. I want you to understand he's going to wrap up in just a moment, number three, and say, uh, and don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, that wasn't a call to come to church. That was a call to hang together. Jesus said, you folks live streaming, let me give you a good word. Just two or three of y'all sitting in the house live streaming today. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. You're there. You're watching a sermon by live streaming. God can do whatever needs to be done for you, and he'll respond to you right there because you're two or three gathered together. Why are we gathered here today? Trying to build a church? Now, we quit that a long time ago. If the church grows, it'll be God who has to grow it because God knows you're not trying to. And neither am I. 
I'll tell you what we are trying to do, though. We're trying to make sure that when you come here on Sundays, what you're going to get here is getting to watch people practice their faith. Not perfect at it. Practicing their faith. One day I'll get mad. An hour later I'll say, I'm sorry, I blew my stack. I'm sorry, please forgive me for that. I shouldn't have said that to you because I'm practicing my faith. I'm trying to live the way I know God wanted me to live. I'm going to say the wrong thing to some of you sometime, not on purpose, don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm going to say the wrong thing. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to forgive me before I even ask because you're practicing your faith as well. And practicing your faith just makes you tolerate my stupidity now and then. And you know that sooner or later I'm going to think about, oh, good Lord, what did I say to them? Did I hurt their feelings? Some of you have been on that phone call a time or two. Did I say the, here's what I think I said. Did I say that today to you? Yesterday when you were passing through, did I say, and some of you said, yeah, but don't worry about it. I did say that, didn't I? And you know why you forgave me? You're practicing your faith. You know why I'm apologizing when I think I did something stupid? Because I'm practicing mine. You know what a privilege it is to come together with two or three like-believing people who are not trying to be perfect, just trying to practice and continue to practice and continue to get over and get better and climb higher? And you know what else you're going to get when you gather together and you come to the church and you gather and watch online? You're going to get encouragement to do better. If we're going to provoke you today, we're not going to try to provoke you to be angry at politics. Get off of that TV station. No, if we have the power to make you angry, we also have the power to make you feel joy, to make you feel comfort, to make you feel better, to make you feel good, and, and to do better. Walk out of here today saying, I'm going to be a little better this week than I was last week. I might owe my boss an apology. I might owe my spouse an apology. I might owe my friend. I might, and why are you going to feel that way? Because I'm going to do my best up here to encourage you to do better. Not to condemn you because you messed up, but to just remind you, I, you, you look around this room. Go, go ahead and just take a moment and look around at other people. I want you to look, I want you to see what a, a screw up looks like. Look, look around at, every, just look. I don't care who you're looking at. You're looking at a screw up. You're looking at somebody messed up. You're, you don't see a perfect person in this room. How dare you sit by them? Why are you so close to them? Because you have learned this is the process of life. It's the way I choose to view you. You are good people trying to be better people. You are humans who will get mad on the way home today in spite of this sermon. You'll honk rudely. And the moment you honk, you'll remember, I said you would. Now don't honk again and drive home calmer. Put on some better music. Listen to something good in the car. Or just don't. Just talk. I love speakerphones in the car. I literally do love them because I talk to God and I know that people driving by don't chuckle anymore and say, he's talking to himself. They think I'm on my car phone. I am so glad for car speaker phones because God and I just talk and you think we're on the phone with somebody. Nope. In fact, I may not even answer you if you call while I'm talking to God in the car and nobody knows. And I've had to absolutely be driving and saying, God, why do I get so mad at people? H help me to understand and just leave people alone and drivers in their place. And, and you know why I feel that way? And you know where that reminder comes from? Because that's what you and I do when we gather together. You're here today not to drag anybody down, not to be superior to anybody, not to condemn anybody for the week they've had. You're here today to provoke somebody to do better. Good works. Keep trying. So you failed? Okay. How many times have you failed? Stories in the Bible are so rich. I, you all know my favorite stories always involve failure. I love the woman at the well because she had been married five times, finally gave up on it just living with a dude. And Jesus says, go get your husband. She said, I don't have one. He said, that's clever. You don't have one. You've in fact had five. The one you're living with now, you're not married to. Go get him anyway. No condemnation from Christ. No lecture. 
No, well, I'm sorry you was raised on the wrong side of the tracks and don't know better. Just finding purpose and worth and value in every human being because we were all created in the image and likeness of God, and that's what you're supposed to hear when you assemble together, and that's why assembling was supposed to be necessary in the eyes of the writer of the book of Hebrews because when you assemble together, you get encouraged to keep trying harder and move on and do better and stay faithful. No matter how big the enemy gets, stay faithful. That's all this is about. That's all this sermon's about. That's all this church is about. I just want to help you today in case your view needs changing. I can't change the window you look out of. That's, that's your life. You are what you are, and in your eyes see what your eyes see. You're always going to look out the same window, but I am telling you, you can see the enemy surrounding you, or you can see God surrounding the enemy. The view is what you decide you're going to see. You've heard me say I joke so much you don't know when I'm serious or not. I know that. It's one of my faults. I'll never get over that. I'm too old now to change it. So I will always be uh, too big a kidder and say too many dumb things, and you'll just have to wonder if it's right or not. But when you hear me say, I just like the psalmist David's stories, and I like his, I like his psalms because I believe in them. I think they were prayers prayed ahead of their time. I, 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 I like that he's my good shepherd. I, I will quote probably at least four or five times a week to nobody in particular, just to me and to God. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't believe bad follows me. I don't, evil, I don't think evil follows me around. It might try. I choose not to see it because I know what surrounds the evil. I know the army of God is bigger than the army of the world. I know that no matter how bad the devil might seem to be now and then, roaring lions seeking whom he may devour, I know the promise of Christ was simply if I resist him, he has to flee from me. I don't know what you interpret the word flee meaning, but flee doesn't mean sauntering out of the room. Flee means hightailing it, get going. All I have to do is resist him. I won't go that path. I won't do that. I just resist him. He has to go. That's what you're supposed to get from each other. That's the encouragement. No condemnation. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Don't know why the man got off scot-free. I guess he could run faster than her. I don't know. They caught a woman in the act, means a man was there. They brought the woman out of the city to stone her. On the way, they ran across Jesus. They thought, let's kill two birds with one stone, pun intended, her and Christ. Hey, Jesus, master, so and so forth, whatever you think you are and you say you are, here's what Moses' law tells us we can do to this woman. What do you say? And Jesus said, simply, after a moment, let him that has no sin throw the first stone. And at least God bless them. Those men had a conscience and started dropping their stones. And in Jesus' words to her, or not, well, shame on you. They might have all run away. That's not what he said, nor is it what he says to you. Jesus' words to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He let her completely off the hook for her choices, and then he gave her the power to go be whatever she wanted to be in the future. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what you're supposed to get in church because this is where Christ wants to be with his body. Two or three gathered here together, their minds and myths. Let him minister to you today and let him help you change your view, the view of life you see through your window. You can see the enemy surrounding you and the devil always after you. Or you can see, you can see the glory of God and the goodness and the mercy that will follow you all the days of your life. Stand with me. Somebody say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Will you give the Lord a hand of praise today? Father, we thank you for your promises. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the church and the church life and the church body. Help us today, God, to just change our point of view, to look 
to look beyond the problems that get us and realize there's a God so much bigger than anything and everything that ever comes against us and our families. You're a gracious and powerful and wonderful God and we have nothing to fear as long as we stay in you and keep our life centered upon you. Our faith must be faithful until the end and we have nothing to fear. Thank you, Father, for your blessing. Thank you for your wonderful mercy. Thank you that you never condemn us. Thank you that you always just provoke us to do better and do better and do better. And may we leave here today with our minds made up to do a little better again. In Christ's name we pray it. And everybody say amen.